talk to you today, uh, this, this end of this morning, and we're going to do a lab this afternoon, is how to derive optical properties of spherical particles, spherical and homogeneous particles. You may ask why are we doing it given that none of our particles are spherical or homogeneous. And the reason is, is because we can, one. But the second reason is that it does provide us intuition of how properties change with size, change with composition, in ways that are easy for you to, to access because you can run these codes which you'll run this afternoon. Just remember that when you're applying it to a specific problem, there might be large uncertainties because the particle under consideration might not be homogeneous in spheres. Okay, so that's, that's the... And there are some idealized codes for non-spherical particles. And you can even build extremely complicated code for any type of particle you might have. It just the computational effort is huge. So you might be able in your thesis to do a coccolito 4 of 5 micron inside. And that will be a chapter in your thesis. And you spend the whole time building that optical model to do light interacting with the coccolito 4. And even then, you don't have the full distribution of coccolito 4s because they, you, know, you have one. And then if the plates are arranged slightly differently, it might be different. So it can be as complicated as one wants. The book I, uh, I really like on the subject is the one by Born and Hoffman. But there's many other books that cover it. The theory was um, written in uh, 1905. Um, and so a lot of books have, have used it. And the, and the question is simple. Is given a particle of a specified size, and we, I mean, this is what we'd like to do. We end up doing it on spheres. Shape and optical properties that is illuminated by an arbitrarily polarized monochromatic wave determine the electromagnetic fields at all the points around that interaction. And those of you who studies acoustics, it's the same exact problem, just with sound waves. So what you're learning, except for there's no polarization in acoustic. Acoustic is a scalar wave. We'll assume that the incident wave is a non-polarized plane harmonic impinging on a spherical particle. I've, this is actually interesting. I've never seen anybody uh, try to apply to... Uh, I mean, in our instrument, we always use non-polarized uh, non sources to study the scattering issue. Not, uh, the attenuation, you can still work with polarized laser because near forward and near backward scattering is done polarized, near pi and, and near. But I've never seen people talk much about, uh, well, it does. I mean, this is what you put in radiative, in polarized radiative transfer models, you'll, you'll have the full polarized. What? It comes out yeah, yeah, you could use me theory to do it. Uh, and I'll show you a little bit of that. And, and there's a large section with a lot of equation. I promised you we're not going to dive deep into them. I just wanted them due to have a reference on them and, and for you to see them. Why should you care about optical theory and mid solution? You can say, oh, well, we use, um, we use beads of known properties to calibrate our sensors. The backscattering sensor, I send it periodically to Jim Sullivan at Florida Atlantic, and he runs beads on my instrument. Flow cytometers. Those of you who have used them, you use beads in them, and, it, and you use the forward scattering measured by the flow cytometer to infer size of particle in them, so it's important. Uh, the list, Wayne Slade, who ta this class and took the class, had a whole paper on the list initially, even though it does an inversion for size, did not report its volume scattering function, because those who were using it were sedimentologists. They couldn't care less. And we went through a process by which, using beads, we we, uh, we showed how one could get the volume scattering function from a, from a least. Uh, Wayne did in his thesis. In addition, for a given concentration of particle of a given size wavelength ratio, uh, wavelength, size to wavelength ratio, needs a refraction, we expect a given signal. Example will come uh, soon. So these are examples of three people that took this class who used me theory in their thesis. So they took the codes they got from us and went and did stuff in the Rebecca Green used me theory to analyze flow cytometer data, assigning size based on forward and back scattering of single cells. 
uh, Giorgio Dalomo used me theory to analyze the yield cycle in optical properties. He was not a student by then, but he, he used the same code. And Tio Kostatinov used me theory to look at the effect of changes of population PSD on remote sensing reflectance. You heard about those. Those are all me theory calculations. You might agree or disagree with how they were applied, but people found them useful. So you may as well. Who knows? So the idea here, you have a, an incident electric and magnetic field coming to your particle. There's a, the, the way the solution works, you have an internal field, you have an external field, and this results in certain boundary conditions on the boundary of your particle, which you, which, which then have to um, relate, uh, sorry, so th that, yeah, that have something to do with the impinging and scattered light. So S is scattered, I is impinging, and one and two are the domains where you solve inside the particle and outside the particle, where you solve these equations. And the equation you solve are Maxwell's equations. So you have to satisfy them. You have plane, you assume plane parallel, parallel harmonics. There's a frequency and there's a wave number. Okay, those of you who have done wave have seen these equations many, many times. Those who have not, don't worry, you don't have to know it to run the codes. You don't. Life is easy. So, and you don't have to remember those either. There's no exam on them. It, just to give you a sense of where they come from, uh, there's two constants in these, the emissivity and permeability um, of the medium. And then you, you, there's a dispersion relationship that links wave numbers to, to frequency. Uh, you can reduce the equation to something like this, which is uh, a wave, once you do it, uh, you remove the time, the time uh, uh, domain. And then there's boundary condition where you assume that the tangential, so tangential, the, the field in this direction relative to the boundary, component of the electric and magnetic field must be continuous across the boundary. And it turns out it's analogous to energy conservation. And the equations and boundary conditions are linear. And therefore, any superposition of a solution and if you have a solution and you have another solution, the sum of them is also a solution. That's the beauty of linear system. So you can use series of functions to try and solve it. Uh, now you go back and say if the, an arbitrary polarized light can be expressed as a superposition of two orthogonal polarization state. That goes back to what you learned from uh, Ken. And we can use some spherical symmetry. Uh, to, for this problem, where these two elements can be thrown out. Um, and then uh, there's, a, again, a relationship between an, an electric field in, in one direct, ah, uh, scattered relative to the impinging. And this is the scattering matrix that determines how you're going to go from impinging to scattered. And I'm not yet in the Mueller matrix. It's coming. And there is spherical spreading. So stuff does spread in space. Uh, again, taking the real part of the, uh, of the squares, we get the intensity. So this is intensity. It's related to elements. I'm going to skip it very soon. And for unpolarized light, you get this expression. So only the two elements, the absolute, the, these are imaginary quantities. So you take their absolute value, it becomes a real number. And this has to do with the volume scattering function. We're going to get there. And so um, the method of solution, again, those of you who took classes in WAVE, is a, is a form of series of orthogonal harmonics. And the larger the particle you deal with, it turns out you need more and more and more elements, more and more waves in your solution. You can also look um, on the polarized versus non-polarized problem of scattering and it all c will come out of your uh, of the code that you are getting, and you can use them to um, as to, to build this Mueller matrix that has to do with the population of particle you care about. So, if I have a population that has certain size, certain properties, you the code will can be used to generate the full Mueller matrix associated with them. This is what people do for atmospheric particles of known properties if they're spherical. 
Again, for spheres, we have all these symmetry relationship. You've seen those. And here we link the Mueller matrix to that scattering matrix. S11 will be this S1 squared plus S2. This is the volumes. This is the phase function. This one will be the difference of them. These are the things you're going to get out of the, the, the code. And these are complex conjugates in different forms linking to it. And then you have, this is known as the uh, uh, depolarization parameter. So how much does light coming in one polar, unpolarized will become polarized, linearly polarized? You just, you'll see it in the literature. I want you to hear it. Solution, you expand incidence and scattered field in spherical harmonics. Spherical harmonics because you're dealing with a sphere, it makes the the, the dependency much easier. You can separate the changes in, uh, with, uh, uh, with radius from, uh, from azimuthal and others. Uh, match solution on boundaries and require them to be finite at large distance. You, don't, you reject every solution that goes to infinity. Uh, the input to the me code, the wavelength in the medium, that's important. Because this is a place where people make errors. You're looking at a medium and a sphere inside. And if your medium is air or your medium in water, you're going to use a different, a different wavelength to describe. Wavelength in the medium. Size. The size of your, your particle in the same unit as the wavelength. You use micron for one, use micron for the other, nanometers for one, nanometer for the other. Again, a place where people make error. And index a refraction relative to the medium that you're embedded in. So a particle, a bubble in water, will be very different than a bubble in air. A bubble in air has the same index of refraction as the medium. It's not going to scatter. A bubble in water has a very different index of refraction. And so... This is important. And when you look for material, say you have quartz, and you're getting an index of refraction of Google, it's the index of refraction relative to air. And you need to correct it by divide by the index of refraction in order to get what it is in water, to get the correct scattering. OK, so all these are important things. And the solution depend, it turns out, on the size parameter. You're going to get the same exact solution if this parameter, I mean, for the same composition of particle, if this parameter stays constant. So the ratio, what's most important is the ratio of diameter to wavelength. Um, yeah, and index of action. OK. The output, what do you get out? You get something called the efficiency factor, which is unitless. And let's, I think we talked a little bit about it. It's, it has to do with the ratio of the optical cross-section to the geometric cross-section. The ratio is unitless, and so how much do you attenuate, if it's QC, or absorb What's your, what's your geometric attenuation or absorption relative to your geometric size? If you get a Q of 1, it means that you're absorbing just as much as you're, you're shadowing, if you will. It's unitless. And then you have the scattering element metrics S1 and S2, from which you can calculate all these things about polarization or the, just the phase function. Uh, you can calculate uh, by difference B equals C minus A, the efficiency factor for scattering, and you can get the, the volume scat the, the phase function. Okay, so now how do we go from me theory to IOPs? So the geometric, the optical cross section here, or the extension cross section for, so this is the, the same one for attenuation, is simply the geometric cross section times QC. And that has unit of meter square, or micron square, whatever units you have for G. Now, if we have one particle for 
one meter cube, one particle for one meter cube. So I have a big meter. Meter cube is about that size. And I have only a single particle in it. The attenuation is going to be this, its cross section, times the QC you get from a me code of one particle in a meter cubed. And that has unit of inverse meter. Okay? The absorption similarly would be the cross section for absorption, which is so it's going to be Q times cross section. This is for absorption, scattering, or beam attenuation, times cross sectional area, times one particle per meter cubed. This will be my absorption B or C. And it will have units of meter to the minus one, which is what I need to get. Okay, so you can think about the cross section. The value of a cross section is representative of the attenuation, the absorption, or the scattering, if it's a scattering cross section, of a single particle in a meter cube. Now, obviously, phytoplankton, we have 10 to the fourth in a milliliter. So now you can expand and see what you, you know, just by sim the algebra for all the IOPs. Now, what do you do when you have a population of particles? If they're all the same, all that I have to do is multiply by n, when the n is the number of particles per meter cube. Population, that's a delta function population. They're all the same. For a polydispersion, I simply add my different sizes, the Q associated with the different sizes, times the cross-section. Not that difficult. And then, if I have a continuous one, I'll have to obviously break it. I have to do a numerical integration of the continuous one. And we're going to go through it in the lab. You're going to do all these things. Uh, and again, you can obtain, you do the same for absorption and attenuation. You just integrate it. And you can also, in certain cases, if you have very simple size distribution, do that. And you, and, and you use approximation, do that numerically. So there are you have me theory, which gives you the exact result for a sphere, and there's also approximation to me theory, which we're going to get to. Okay. So the next thing is optical regimes. Um, it turns out that in there's, and particularly before the age of computers, it was extremely useful to be able to calculate the output of, of me theory, which was established in, in uh, 1905, before the advance of computers, to, to work, to get solutions for. So you have the Rayleigh regime, which is particle significantly smaller than, say, 0.2 micron. And there's a parameter rho, which is defined. Where is it defined? It should have been defined here. Let's see if I define it below. Where is rho? Rho is defined here. So rho is So you'll see that many these approximation they they define a parameter space. So you have the size parameter which is this guy and this is called x and then you have rho which is 2x n minus 1. And all these approximation are based on what ranges these are. So if you have a parameter much, if you have a particle much bigger than the wavelength, x is much, much bigger than, than 1. If you have a, uh, and, and if you have, in addition, if its index of refraction is very close to 1, then you're going to have a row that's much less than 1. And this is useful because it simplifies me theory a lot, and you can get, you can use these approximations. So here it is. These are the assumptions. So rho much smaller than 1, d much smaller than 1, you're in the Rayleigh regime. And Rayleigh regime is where you have really soluble substance and some of the dissolved organic material. You know, it's the nanometer size. Viruses will be Rayleigh, probably. Then you have another domain that's called the rayleigh gans And These are all names of famous scientists that have derived approximations that one could use. They're just simple analytical expression. 
And so it's a good test uh, for some of us. Those are mathematically inclined and would rather not use only the, the, the full series, it's useful. So Rayleigh Gans divide, this is 105 is organic particle, 117 is like a sediment. This is why you have two of those. So Randy Gans divide, this will cover colloids. Uh, I don't know why I put viruses at one micron. They tend to have several, I mean, they're further down. Organic detritus, that, that's small, that will be covered by it. Then we have another domain, it's called the Van der Halst solution or anomalous uh, diffraction approximation. That covers a lot of the phytoplankton. It's a very useful approximation. It requires that rho is not large, and this is why it's important that n is close to 1. But the particle itself can be large in that regime, because n compensates for it and keeps rho relatively reasonable. And then finally, we have geometric optics, when rho is really large. And this is where you basically are looking at the shadow of the particle, the, the particle. Uh, and that's for very large particles. So these are all very, very useful for people who want to do things with pencil and paper or with a, or get some intuition as to how things behave. And this is why they were derived. So here is an example of some of these approximations. We're not going to get into details into them, but you can see what they provide. In the Rayleigh regime, we know exactly the shape of the phase function. We have a very nice description of QA and QB, uh, where M M is the uh, index of refraction relative to the medium. And it's a, an imaginary number. This is why, again, you have the imaginary part here. The imaginary part of the index of refraction, by the way, is proportional to absorption uh, of the material that's in the particle if it was in solution. So it's not if it was diluted by the water around, just if it was all, if it's chlorophyll in the case of a pigment, it's as if you took this material and all you had is just that pigment in solution not packaged. Um, anyways, a bunch of approximation. We don't have to go to them, there, and there's plenty of uh, description of that in, in the Van der Hals book, as well as in the, uh, the, the book by Born and Hoffman. But they're very useful. You'll see their utility when we'll discuss them this afternoon, and that's why I wanted to talk to you about them. And then why do we care about them? Again, we talked about this ability to, and here is an example where we might use them. Here is a, is a, a, a question. What's the likely beam attenuation at 660 for a given concentration of phytoplankton? You go to the lab, you measure your flask on microscope, you get a certain value. Can you tell what the beam attenuation is likely to be? The answer is yes. Okay, how do we go about it? Oh, this is already solving it. Okay, what's the size of your phytoplankton? Come on, guys. Tell me. Give me a size. Five. What? Five micron. Five micron. Okay, so I have a, is it, let's say it's the diameter. Okay. And I'm going to go, I already told you that phytoplankton are somewhere in this domain, the Van der Hals domain. I'm going to go and look in the Van der Hals regime, which is the next page. I'm now here. Uh, and I'm asking for attenuation. So I have to calculate all these betas and rows and whatever. So I'm going to go here, and I'm going to calculate what the row is. Ah, we forgot. We just said wavelength is 660 nanometer. By the what? what is it in water? What's the wavelength in water? So in water, it's going to be divided by 1.34. Can you tell me what that is? It's about 3 quarters of that. 440. It's three quarter, 0.75 of this. Yeah, you're right, 440. So my x, which is pi 
d over lambda equals? It's 490? It's 490. OK. Sorry. Uh, we can now calculate what this guy is. We know the diameter. It's 5 micron, which is, I need to do it in nanometer. So 5,000 divided by 490. Let's assume that this is 500. It's good enough. So this is going to be 10, 10 pi, about 32. Something. That's it. So I have an x of 32. My rho is 2x times n minus 1. 2x n minus 1. For phytoplankton, n, what's a good back of the envelope? 1.05 relative to water. Minus 1, 0 0.05 times 2, 0 0.1 times x, 3.2. No magic. OK, so now I know my x, my rho. Here I can go one before. My, well, here we did in diameter. But we're here. We might, my rho is 3.2. I'm almost in Rayleigh Gantz. I'm almost here. If I were in Rayleigh Gantz, these are, well, I can do absorption at least. Absorption, it tells me should be something like the, the cross-section for absorption. If I'm in the Rayleigh Gantz, this should be 8 over 3. Ah, and I forgot the imaginary part of the index of refraction. 660, it's not a very strong absorbing. Maybe we can assume n prime to be something like 0 0.01 has not Again, you, you guys gonna we're gonna play on how you get it from a culture. If you have an absorbing culture, you can actually inversely derive what the n prime is likely to be. But if let's assume this, so um, eight over three, imaginary of m minus one. M is m. My m is uh, one point oh five plus i 0, 0.0, uh, yeah, 1. And now I'm doing minus 1 and taking the imaginary part. It's only 0, 0.01. So my QA is this, according to this approximation. This is a little more, uh, I mean, we're somewhere in between these two. No, not the Rayleigh, sorry. We're somewhere between this and the... Uh, and, and so this is QA. My CA is my geometric cross-section, pi d squared over 4 times this. This is, if I assume this is, uh, let's, this is about uh, this times 3. So let's say we call it 3. Here I get the attenuation, the cross-sectional area for attenuation. This is 5 micron, uh, and I want it in, in meters, so 5 times 10 to the minus 6. All this squared uh, will divide by 4. The 3, 3 times uh, 3.14, it's going to be 9. It's going to be about 2 times 25, or 5, 0, 10 to the minus 12. Sorry. What? From QA? Uh, yeah, from QA I went to here. Yeah, but aren't are we missing the x value? You're right. It's not time, it's x. You're right. So we need turn two. You're right. You're absolutely right. And this is why it says here, node proportional to lambda minus 1, because lambda is proportional. You're absolutely right. So this is about 1. My QA is about 1. QA about 1 means I'm already getting the full shadow. Imaginary numbers, imaginary index of refraction, 
Now, 10 to minus 1 is an absorption peak. 10 to the minus 2, sorry, is an absorption peak. Right. And, you said and, and, and I said 660. I said 660. So you're absolutely, so I, I should at least one order of magnitude less than a 440. A four, 440 peak will be 0 0.01. You're absolutely right. So this will be about not 1, but 0.3. And actually, this shows you that for this size particle, if it was a strong absorption peak, I already absorb everything at this regime. So if I do it as a, as a 0 0.01, a weakly absorbing point, point 0.1, the whole, the whole thing. Point, point, yeah, point 0.3 times 32. And I get 0 0.01, point 0.03 times 32. Sorry. So now I have about point 0.1. 0 0.1. I'm putting it here. I'm getting. We put it here. No. Take out the zero. 0.1. Sorry. Times 50 times 10 to the minus 12. I had 0.1, and I have to divide by 4. So, uh, 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 uh. 5 squared is 25 divided by 4. Time 0.1 is 2.5 divided by 4. 0.6. 25 times 0.1 is 2.5 divided by 4 is 0 0.6. 0 0.6 10 to the 12. So this is what I'll have if I had a single particle per meter cube. Now, and this is not beam attenuation. I'm doing something different than what I've asked because I've asked for beam attenuation. But let's look at it just from the perspective of absorption. I have, uh, what's your culture? How, how many particles you have in your culture on average? Throw me a number. 10 to the 6. 10 to the 6. That's a very dense culture. OK. 10 to the 6, phyto per ml. OK, so now I have to take this and multiply it by this to get the absorption. This was one particle per meter cubed. Let's see what we're going to get for absorption. So this is per milliliter, but I want to know it per meter cube. How much is this per meter cube? How many milliliter do I have a meter cube? No, you have a thousand liter in a meter cube. How many milliliter? What? It's a million. A million. Yeah. So I have a million times. I already have a million per milliliter. So that's 10 to the 12 Fido in a liter. Sorry, that was too much. That was too OK. Much now, look. I'm multiplying this by this. My absorption is 0 0.6 meter to the minus 1. Is this reasonable in my culture? Is this a reasonable number for a dense culture? Totally. See, the, the, and this is the power of these kind of things. Immediately you can, do I get something that's reasonable? See, and we had big numbers, small number. I made errors, whatever. You guys helped me. We got there. Oh, at least, <laughs> at least. But this is, this is how you go about, this is why these are useful. Yes, you can go and find your computer, but you can run. So with this respect, with this 660, um, I, ah, this one was for large particles. So what I used here, I assumed, let's assume we're in, in the, uh, uh, now the other regime. If you're much bigger than the wavelength, which regime are you in? Geometric optics. Geometric optics, what's your QC? What's your attenuation uh, efficiency factor? It's about two. When you shadow what you, we, we talked about it before. You shadow your own cross-section, and then the stuff that's refracted around you and doesn't make it to the target. So if it's two, let's assume, and I have 10 to the fifth per liter in this case of phytoplankton, but we could use the 10 to the sixth. 
you do the same calculation, you have two times the area, you're going to get something like 2 pi 20 squared. This is radius. I used radius here, not, not uh, 10 to the minus 12 tube for, the, for this guy. And then you get a beam attenuation of about 0.25 inverse meter. Totally reasonable. And if you add what you had here for these guys, it's going to be 2.5 if you had 10 to the 6 per ml. This is per milliliter, this is per, per meter cubed. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Ken, for giving me an excuse. This is per milliliter, this is per meter cubed. But this is a dense culture. In the ocean, the kind of back of the envelope number is 10 to the fourth. Kind of, you know, st out, out station. So d just use, this is where these, these relationships are useful, just to develop intuition. Okay, another one. If you look at Paul Hill's paper, he's going to be here. Um, he shows that beam attenuation per mass is about 0.5 meter square per gram. Is this a reasonable value? What do you think? So how would we go about it? This guy per mass. And this is for sediments. Let's say you read a paper and somebody tells you this is my mass specific beam attenuation. So what do I need to do? How do I develop an intuition to that? So what is mass? How do I do mass for a bunch of particles? How do I do mass? Again, I'd assume they're all the same size. So mass would be the number times their volume. So you keep to radius because it's easy for us. They say pi r cube times their density. If we use for beam attenuation, if I now do the same for beam attenuation, what did I say? Beam attenuation. I need the number of particles times Cx. So number of particle per meter cubed times Cx. And this we said was equal to N times G times QC. And if, the, if they're large enough, this guy is going to be 2 about 2. And this guy is going to be pi r square. That's the cross-section area. I say r square and I write r cubed. So beam attenuation divided by mass, this divided by that, that's my, beam, my specific beam attenuation, is going to be beam, this divided by that. So I have, my ends are going to go away. I don't care anymore how many I have. I don't have to think about it. It's going to be pi r square times qc, let's say 2 if it's large enough, divided by this guy, 4 over 3 pi r cubed times density. So this is the 3 I can pass up. It's going to be 6 divided by 4, 3 over 2. I have 3 over 2, 3 pi over 2. That's leading. I have 1 over r. And I have rho. Anybody knows the density of sediments? About. But it's kind of back of the envelope. Turns out it's about 2.5 gram per centimeter cubed. Okay, and here, do I have grams here? Yeah, I have grams, so I'll keep that unit. But the centimeter cube, I need to move to meter. Uh, well, yeah, so I, if this is equal. If this is per meter cubed, I have to multiply by 10 to the 6. So it's going to be 2.5, 10 to the 6 gram per meter cubed. 
That's my density. What? Ah, I have pies in both. Excellent. Excellent. Life is good. No pies. <laughs> Pi went, the n went. Now I have the rho, I have the 2.5 here times 2.5. 10 to the 6. Gram per meter cubed. Have to be still. So, n I have an r here. So the meter cube goes up, it's meter cubes per gram, and then one of the meters is going to go away because I have a size here. So this is, yeah, so now I don't have this and I have per gram. Yeah, okay, good. So now I can ask myself, if Paul tells me this is 0.5, what's kind of the average size of sediment that will give me that? So Paul tells me this is 0 0.5 in his paper. Let's see if I get a sediment that's in the right range, meaning 10 microns, something like that, or something in that range. Now, I'll, to get the R, I'm going to multiply the other. So my R is about, and then I'll divide by 10 to the 5. And this is going to be in, in meters. What I'm going to get is it's going to be in meters. So I'm going to move it here, because this one has units of meter square per gram. So I'm going to divide it by 0.5. I'm going to get 3 over 2. Here I get a 0 0.5. Here I get a 2.5, which is about 3, about 1. I'm getting 1 micron. One, oh no, what am I saying? 1, yeah, 1 10 to the minus 6 uh, meters. I'm in the ballpark. I would expect it a bit larger, but I, because I assumed Q to be a Q of a large particle relative to the wavelength. This is order of the wavelength. But the right, if I reduced QC some, I would get an even smaller one. If I reduce QC, QC would be beam attenuation. No, that would be in the right direction. So this is the, the uh, what am I saying? Now I'm falling in your trap. Um, yeah, here I get about 0.1. It's a reasonable size for clay, except that for clay, my QC should be a bit smaller. Clay is about 0.7. But this is what this will be consistent with. And this is the right density for clay. So we're in the right ballpark. But I'll, I'll have to, this is a large value for something that is small. It should be more like 1. You, you'll see it when you do the calculation this afternoon. But again, this is a place where you're developing an intuition. You can test whether values that people give you make sense or not. Similarly, you can do chlorophyll-specific absorption and things of that nature that, that are important for many. Here we have some resources. There's tons of codes. And this afternoon, when you come back from lunch, we're going to start playing MATLAB with these, with these codes. And you're going to do similar problems like the one I've done in, the, in front of you. Uh, and hopefully with better dexterity and, and less algebraic mistakes. Questions? You're in shock. You look like you're shocked. <laughs> it's OK. <laughs> It does. I mean, you should be able to do it in your brain without even writing it. <laughs> but this is, this is why, you know, the, the first thing this peanut gallery and myself can do when we read a paper is like this sense if somebody's numbers are full of shit or not. 
I just look at it and that doesn't make sense. And because we developed through the years these intuitions to what things should be. And not by remembering by heart, but just by being able to manipulate simple relationships. Just looking at them. Same with units. I look at an equation immediately. That cannot happen. I mean, they're just left side and right side of different units. It, it's, it's the first thing I see when I read the paper. These are the things that pop up. Elena. This is I get from this approximation. So this is when you're in this regime where you're much larger than the wavelength, geometric optic, which we didn't know we will be, and it turns out we were not. But 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 when you're in this regime, QC is two. I think, yeah, I think a long time ago, like three weeks ago. We had it in one of the lectures. Very rapid rise. Yeah. And the more absorbing the particle, the less oscillation there are. And the more smooth is that curve. So you need to use the conversion criteria in all these cases where you say, okay, if my next element is not adding more than X percent to my solution, I just ignore it. So that's why you'll see when you run big particles, it takes longer than when you run small particles because you need more terms to get to the conversions. But do it for Born and Offman, who, who people use their code, and then you'll find that it's probably 10,000. And so this is another thing. If you, if you again, uh, this is part of my marketing talk, but if you write a code in, that you use for your paper, and you give that code away, the citation of your papers are going to go through the roof. If somebody has to code the same thing you used, the likelihood they're going to do it goes very much down. So sharing makes things, you know, makes people use your stuff. Not just sharing the paper, the results, but also sharing the tool you develop to get these results. Again, part of the marketing talk that... Seriously, it's, 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 it's so evident, but this is true for all marketing, that then when people think, oh yeah, that would be a good idea to share the code. But it is. Just, <laughs> it just makes life easier. Anyways, questions? It also...